transmission. How about a smoke? No, thank you. I don't smoke. But I'll light it for you. Smokers, how considerate are you really to those around you? You may not do this, but the effect can be the same with your secondhand smoke. The switch of your dial radio brings you tragedy, comedy, entertainment, information, education. A whole world at your command. But there are stories behind radio. Stories as amusing, dramatic, and as interesting as any make-believe stories you hear on the air. The story of Philco Radio is a multifaceted one. To promote their products, Philco sponsored many radio programs throughout the years, from Bing to Rudy Valley and the Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra. Their first show in 1928, The Philco Hour, starred Jessica Dragonette. She was a Victor recording artist, destined to become one of early radio's brightest stars. In 1939, she was the singing voice of the princess in Max Fleischer's Gulliver's Travels. to her popularity is the fact she was chosen queen of radio. Hey, New York, we will now give you the correct time. When you hear the beautiful chime, it will be exactly 8 o'clock. Eastern Daylight. While experiments with radio dated back to the 19th century, radio broadcasting as we know it began in 1920. The first radios were either simple crystal sets or table models requiring a large contingent of batteries and were difficult to operate. But within two years, 70,000 homes and farms had radios. By the time of our story, 1929, over 10 million had them. Philco was the offspring of the Philadelphia Storage Battery Company, which was founded in 1906 to make batteries for electric cars and trucks. By 1919, their sales reached the million dollar mark. In 1921, radio burst upon the scene creating a whole new market for storage batteries. Within three years, Philco's sales were over four million dollars. Their next big boost came in 1925 with the development of the battery eliminator. Philco sold almost a million of them in the next two years. Then in 1927 came the widespread adoption of the AC tube, which would make Philco's products obsolete. With a recognized brand name and established dealers across the country, they had only one logical choice to build radios. For their inaugural 1928 line of radios, Philco purchased the parts and assembled them. 
The cabinets were beautiful, and some table models were hand-painted. Their sales placed them 26th in the industry. Sales were poor mainly because the sound quality of their speakers was not up to the industry's best. Determined to succeed, they went back to the drawing board. In order to increase volume and reduce production costs, Philco realized it had to make a sizable investment, not only to enlarge their plants, but following Henry Ford's assembly line methods to redesign their factories for mass production. Their new 1929 line featured a larger choice of models. Like their first year's radios, they had illuminated dials and relatively new to the industry, one-knob tuning. This was a great improvement over early radios. Less than five years earlier, three dials were required to tune a radio. They were the butt of many a joke. It was reasoned, why should a young man need two hands to tune a radio when he needed only one to drive a car? At the end of 1929, Philco's sales placed them third in the industry, just behind Majestic and Atwater Kent. Join us now as we present the story of how Philco manufactured radios in the Roaring Twenties using skilled hands and ingenious machines when the United States was a world leader in manufacturing. The Roaring Twenties were a time of prosperity. The whole country seemed to live just to have fun. The era is best remembered today for those fabulous flappers. The marathon dance craze that swept the country like a storm. And how about those unbelievable ticker tape parades? Let's not forget about prohibition. It made Al Capone's name a household word. Now let's look at the record. Prohibition has found a new line of endeavor for the underworld. They brought life to the bootleggers. And the bootleggers begot the hijackers. And the hijackers begot the racketeers. My friends of the radio audience, the only cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy. An age where daredevils abounded and nobody worried about tomorrow. After all, everything would only get better. Unknowingly, Philco had taken a gamble as risky as any of these stunts. The 20s were still roaring when they decided to go into radio production. The prosperity bubble was still growing. Philco had to cease all production for several months and go heavily into debt to tool up. Luckily, they were able to make their niche in the marketplace before the bubble burst. By 1929, Philco had nine factories covering two city blocks. Within these facilities, they produced every component and part except the tubes. Our journey starts with the manufacturing of the condenser plates. After they are stamped out, they're gathered up and soldered in place. Philco borrowed heavily for the modernization and almost went bankrupt. It meant rebuilding in mid-year and closing down the factory for three months and extending their credit past its limit. visual inspection, the tuning condenser is connected to a test fixture to assure that it will tune the radio correctly.
John Wokonowitz, in his master's thesis, MIT 1981, on the Philco Corporation, states, In order to build a competitive price barrier, Philco kept production costs low by utilizing the latest production technology and by adding to plant capacity only when necessary. In order to retain the best dealers in the industry, Philco kept close watch on sales and scheduled production to prevent overstocking. Product engineering and styling were superb and prices were set just below the competition. Consider how different our auto and steel industries would be today if they had adhered to that philosophy. For those who doubt the strength of one of these over-designed chassis pans, Philco gives us a graphic demonstration of how tough they are. Watch this. Some customer must have wondered about the mysterious footprints on his radio chassis. Machine tools, row after row of them. Lathes, boring machines, screw machines, all performing their individual duties. Today in the United States, we import almost everything. Or if it is made here, it may get shipped off to Mexico for assembly. Philco did it all in their own factories, including every nut and bolt. The man responsible for their success in radio was James M. Skinner, Philco's general manager. He was the guiding hand from its inception until 1939 when he left. It may be a coincidence, but Philco started a slow downward spiral then that ended in 1961 with its sale to Ford Motor Company. Guided by skilled operators in another section, machines with a more delicate mission. Philco developed their own machine for winding aluminum foil and paper together to make the various condensers used throughout the radio. This interesting machine automatically checks the condensers and rejects the bad ones. Philco also designed a machine that accurately winds a coil. Just 600 turns and the machine cuts the wire. Philco's pride, the new electrodynamic speaker had a factory all to itself. The voice coil, the heart of any speaker even today, is joined with a cone on this fixture for assembly and alignment. The cementing process over, they are removed from this carousel-like machine. The power plant of the speaker, a coil wound with 3,500 feet of wire and the heavy steel pot which houses it. Meanwhile, another worker assembles a cable, some insulators, and a few eyelets. For product, the speaker cable and plug. The cone starts at one end of a long conveyor belt, and step by step it is built up to what Philco called a balanced unit. The field, the frame, the bracket, the output transformer, the cone married together. Finally, it became the perfection of science. The Philco Electrodynamic Speaker. This was the state of the art for sound reproduction in its day.
Progressing down the line, each is quickly connected to a test fixture for functional tests. When passed, they are sent on. Test results are noted for each speaker, and it is quickly sent on to resume its journey. Assembly has begun. All the parts and components moving toward the point where there will become a new Philco radio. With the tube sockets wired and soldered, the coil shielding cans are spun on. Things are coming together fast. More components are added to the chassis pan, and conveyors transport the growing chassis pan from one assembly area to another. Before our eyes, the radio is growing steadily towards a finished product. Meanwhile, on the floor below, there are three of these assembly lines to meet Philco's sales demands. As an example of Philco's leadership in the industry, they made their first television set in 1937. The belt moves just fast enough for each operation to be completed. Ready for more wiring, the inverted assemblies have wiring harnesses set in place. As other parts are added, each worker performs their task. Another chassis joins the assembly parade to soon become another Philco radio. With the wiring done, the inspectors take over, checking solder joints. Note that every connection is readily accessible under the base for easy service, and those that don't pass inspection are removed for repair. And yet another test to maintain Philco's quality standards. Now on to a tour of Philco's furniture factory and workmanship that is rarely seen today. First we see the legs turn. and papering the legs automatically. Mm -hmm. 
cutting out the speaker grill. Stroke sanding with a sanding belt. Finally, with all the pieces done, it's time to glue the cabinet. This massive clamp holds the cabinet until the glue is dry. The stain is sprayed on the top. After the lacquer is dry, the cabinet is hand rubbed. The final assembly and final check of the radio which guaranteed Philco's quality. Searching tests to check the accurate alignment of all units. With its handsome product, Philco reached into homes across the country bringing beauty and happiness. And bringing our story full circle, Philco followed its sets into the home with a broadcast of the Philco Hour on NBC. The Philco Chorus undoubtedly sang the praises of the sponsor's product, as did this rare Philco sales film for their brand new line for 29.
Placing third in sales their second year in the radio business, Philco was on a winning streak that would carry it through the Depression. Throughout its history, Philco would prove to be a company of innovation. In 1930, the introduction of the Cathedral model met with phenomenal success. It would be the largest selling radio ever made, despite the Depression. Its styling would soon be mirrored by the whole industry. Philco was to be the undisputed sales leader until World War II. Today, old radios have joined the ranks of so many things from our past and are now prized as antiques. You'll find them at auctions. You'll find them at antique and collectible shows. And more importantly, you may even find them in homes, still bringing enjoyment these many years later. For further research and appreciation of radio's history, we recommend these publications. The encyclopedic three-volume set on radio manufacturers of the 1920s by the noted authority on radio history, Alan Douglas. In 1938, Hugo Gernsback, editor of Radio Craft magazine, had a Golden Jubilee edition celebrating 50 years of radio. Vestal Press has made a quality reprint of it available. Ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience, the McHangnail Cuticle Company presents... Encore Entertainment is pleased to offer an hour of comedies and cartoons devoted to radio. Oh, here we go again. Yeah, this I gotta see. <laughs> the Many Faces of Radio is presented by Hollywood. From Edgar Kennedy, the master of the slow burn. Yeah, remember the time you fixed the car? It wouldn't run for a month. Do you uh, remember the Mother-in-law, dear, you want the radio fixed so you can listen to the dizzy little bees, don't you? Well, yes. Well, then, why don't all of you go out of here and leave me alone? So to Tom Ewell, who encounters Murphy's Law when he tries to listen to the big games. Popular radio personalities influenced the animated cartoon, and some cartoons were based on popular radio shows. This hour of radio fun is available for only $19.95 plus shipping. 
special offer to purchasers of Philco. You can purchase radio cartoons and comedies for only $16.95 plus shipping when you include the corner of the cover. See your dealer for Encore Entertainment. Stand by, please. Is everybody listening? The March of Time production on the state of radio in the 1940s is also available in Encore Entertainment's radio series. Show a little trivia my air raid warden's helmet, Molly. I wouldn't know where to look for it, dearie. Oh, I know where it is. It's right here in the hall clock. Oh, no, no. Got to straighten out that closet one of these days. In Toledo. And thanks to the following companies for their generous donations for our volunteers. Presentation of Toledo on the Air is made possible by a grant from Paramount Elite, the Paramount plan for Medicare beneficiaries on behalf of the thousands of Toledo area residents who have made Paramount Elite their Medicare choice. Remember when Art Berry interviewed your neighbors on the street for WSPD? How about 